Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, the very deep coastal low pressure system we had spent so much time talking about over the last couple of weeks came into fruition this weekend, and it was a powerful low pressure system. You're seeing some satellite imagery today of what this system looked like as it was beginning to decay here, moving closer to the coast. But yesterday, let me just go back over last night and show you what this thing looked like late on Sunday afternoon. It was a very powerful and deep low pressure system. Uh, the pressure, pressure actually bottomed out at around 900. 142 millibars and you may have heard it called several different things this week and one of the things you, things you may have heard it called was a bomb cyclone. And I just want to take a moment and talk to you about what that is and I'm going to show you a publication. Now this was in the, the journal Monthly Weather Review. That's a journal by the American Meteorological Society and you can see it was written by Fred Sanders and Fred Sanders was kind of a famous uh, atmospheric scientist. He's one of the pioneers of numerical weather prediction. He wrote some really cool models to help us understand what we call synoptic dynamic media Meteorology, and he defined a bomb, okay, as an extratropical cyclone where the central pressure falls at an average of one millibar per hour for 24 hours. So what we're looking at here is a rapidly intensifying low pressure system. That's all that that is. So when you kept hearing maybe certain news media outlets calling this a, a bomb cyclone, that's what it is. It's actually got a meteorological definition, one millibar per hour for 24 hours. Uh, now, one of the reasons why Fred studied this so extensively is because of its impact on numerous things, including uh, supply chain management, the shipping of goods, the movement of goods, because these big winter storm systems like this can be really be disruptive, especially to ocean liners as they produce incredibly large uh, waves. Now, speaking of waves, as the moisture kind of wrapped around into the tail of this, okay, came all the way from Hawaii and just streamed here into California. It brought in a tremendous amount of, of rainfall. And I'm going to show you a cool website here. It's called oroville.lakesonline.com. And Oroville here, we're talking about Lake Oroville in Northern California. Now take a look at these data. When California finished its wet season, the lake peaked in late April at around 729 feet. That was the, the, the water level. It then dropped about 100 feet between late and April uh, and just you know up to this point in October so 100 feet drop now that's common for it to drop that much through summer but if you look on this graphic you can see we're comparing it to like 2020 and 2019 and so it was well below what it had been and that's why so much of the state is still in exceptional drought but you see the little peak at the very end there that's 20 feet 20 feet of gain that the lake has had just in the last two days and it's going to continue to go up as the moisture continues to funnel into that large reservoir. Now remember before this, let's see here, that reservoir, there you go, had uh, was 25% of full pool. Uh, lake Shasta, another very large reservoir, was um, was at 22% full pool. But as we go back and look again over the last 72 hours, the total accumulated precipitation map here shows us that there's a broad region here across the west that, that saw in excess of five to eight inches of rain, some places well over a foot of rainfall. Heavy rain up against the Payette National Forest, the Salmon River Valley in through here, and also the Snake River Valley. And then the other big system was the one that came out of, of the Central Plains and moved through the Corn Belt. And this just put a complete stop on all harvest efforts uh, this past weekend because some places in through here, not only did we see lots of severe storms in this area, but we also saw heavy rains, some places adding up an additional three to five inches, parts of, uh, for example, parts of Missouri and into Illinois and Indiana. Now, what we're going to be watching as we go forward in this forecast is going to be two things. Uh, the system in the West has really brought about a change we have to talk about. And then we're going to see another round of precip that's going to go through the Midwest, again, chasing us out of the fields. I'm going to get to that in just a few seconds here. Uh, but first, let's get some stats on this. This would be month-to-date precipitation ranks by climate district as of Sunday morning. Okay, so we'll get a Monday morning update tomorrow, and so this is through Sunday morning. And what we're looking for here are just regions that throughout October have been very wet. So that's been a lot of this section of the Midwest out of the Mid-South in Texas. This area is an area that's been exceptionally wet, especially earlier in the month. We've got drier pockets that have developed in parts of the Mid-Atlantic and Florida. And because of the rain shadow effect, you can see that the ongoing longer term drought in this part of Montana is going to continue. On the temperature side of this, this is where we're at. So this is month to date, again, through Sunday morning, and it shows us a number of climate reporting districts in and around the Great Lakes in the Northeast that are having a top five warmest uh, October on record. And as we've been discussing, we were anticipating, although I was anticipating a bit too early, but we've been anticipating a pattern shift, and we've got to talk about that. So what I'm going to do the long range first again in this video, and then we'll dig into the near-term stuff. The pattern has to shift from here. 
this is what we've seen. There's been this ridge we talked about last week here, the trough of low pressure right up in this part of British Columbia and the Gulf of Alaska, and this almost immovable and very large ridge over uh, Greenland to the Hudson Bay. So that flow pattern has just been doing this. When you get flow out of the southwest coming over the mountains, it generates low pressure systems. They produce precipitation. Southwest flow during uh, you know, spring, winter, and fall. Okay, It's a little different in summer, but spring, winter, and fall, that southwest flow like this is just going to ignite those low pressure systems, and we've seen that. And we just saw the biggest of which come into California. So this is the pattern we have to break away from. Now, what I'm going to do for you, since we're doing this long term, is I'm going to go right out uh, to the end of this next seven-day time period, so next Monday afternoon. And look, instead of having the trough here, can you actually see, I'll just look at the whole thing. You can see how the whole wave train pattern has shifted? There's a trough there. Now the ridge is here. Trough is in this area, and there's a ridge in place there. Now, again, we're looking. Do you just see the shift? We've moved this whole wave train. And it started, I think, with the shifting of the troughs in the Gulf of Alaska. They've moved west. So that builds a ridge in place here and a trough in this area. So while this will bring warmer conditions here and it will bring cooler conditions there, it will do one other thing. We talk about this a lot, right? Ridge into trough. The northwest flow gives us convergence in the jet stream. Convergence leads to sinking motion. Sinking motion leads to higher pressure. It leads to clear skies, drier conditions. So that's what we're going to be seeing out of this pattern. We're going to get a break finally in this area. Now thinking about all of that, I want to show you the temperature pattern first. We're going to go way out there, day 10 through 15. For the first time, you know, we started seeing this last week, but this is the real strong signal here that with that ridge redeveloping here and the downstream trough, we're going to go cooler finally in the eastern half of the country. And that's breaking a trend that we've seen like this throughout much of this month. So we're going to be seeing that cooler weather, and it's in both models. In fact, uh, let's see here, there's the European. The European is substantially cooler in this area. All right, so this is a pretty significant pattern shift. When we go asking ourselves why, I think the MJO has got part of this teleconnection. I think it's just a shift in the wave train pattern across the, the, the northern hemisphere. But the MJO spent so much of early October and mid-October here, and so we saw the effect of that being in phase five and six as to favoring more ridging over um, you know, Hudson Bay to, to Greenland. And what happened is, is it's now moved to where it's focused basically on the opposite side of the diagram. So we tend to get, as we talked about last week, the opposite uh, pattern shift here. But it takes time. It, it, it's going to take you know, another week. That would be about 10 days from when we first kind of broke this, this pattern. So it's, it's a 10-day lag or so. But it does mean, I'll go back and show it again, that we're going to be going, there we go, uh, to, to a, a cooler start to the month of November. All right. So that's what we're looking at here. Now, it's cooler. It's not cold. And that's the other big point I want to make here. We have not yet built up a major storehouse of cold in this area that we can just bring around. And there's certainly none over the Hudson Bay. So this is a cooler pattern, but not a icy cold pattern. So brand new European long range data, month of November. Now you can start to see the reflection and what we kind of called for in the forecast change. That would be the cooler pattern here. Much of the North America is going to, or excuse me, the United States is going to see near normal to cooler, more, more cooler than normal days. We still have the warmer bias farther to the north here, but this is largely because we haven't built up the snowpack yet, and we have yet to see a real kind of big storehouse of cold come in here. Now, as you would expect, this is what the 30 days of November looks like for precip. All right. With that flow pattern coming over a ridge here, that northwest flow. Summer, it means thunderstorms. In fall, winter, and spring, it's convergence in the jet stream. And as a consequence, we're going to be getting drier conditions. And there's a lot of people in here that would need this to finish harvest. All right. So long range out of the way first, but I do want to add one more component to this. If you remember, I showed you last Thursday that the CFS V2 model, it's not a model that I generally trust that much. It just flip-flops a lot. Well, look at the flip-flop that it made. This is its new week three and week four temperature pattern. Now, remember, the warmer colors represent temperatures above average, and these green to blue represent below. Now, if you looked at last week when I showed you this, it was calling for this time period to be a plus 3.5 Celsius warm bias, and now it's way down here. <laughs> so that model really shifting quite a bit. So that's what we're watching for. This is going to be a much different November than we saw October, and the pattern really has already started its break. All right? Now, in the meantime, we're still dealing with a pretty active pattern. 
So for example, the low pressure center that moved across Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, is still sitting over Indiana late this afternoon. It's still kind of a bit of a problem for the Northeast and along the Mid-Atlantic. In fact, we're starting to watch some storms popping through here. We're gonna be concerned this evening with the chance for some strong to severe storms in this part of North Carolina and Virginia. A lot of low hanging cloud on the back side of this. And you can continue to see this very strong flow out of the Southwest that we're still getting from that uh, big trough there. Now, over the next three days, we got tonight, we're gonna to keep an eye on this area for severe storms. Tomorrow, when this wave ejects into the plains, it's gonna give us a chance for severe storms that could stretch from central Texas up to southern parts of Nebraska. SPC is issued an enhanced risk in this region. Then as we get into the day on Wednesday, that severe weather threat's gonna translate down here uh, into parts of Texas, Louisiana, down near the coast, and also Mississippi. So I want to show you that by going right away to our high-res NAM model. Good, the 18Z just came in, and I like to play this on out for you. So going through this evening, uh, there's our first kind of line of storms coming through this region. So we're watching that scattered showers all around this low. And as we play forward into this tonight, getting into tomorrow morning, remember that that deep flow out of the southwest coming over the Great Basin into the Four Corner States got snow on the backside of this. This is 7 a.m. on Tuesday. By the time we get into Tuesday afternoon and evening, there's our least cyclone, that's what we call that. There's some cyclogenesis here, and that low is gonna to start to form. And you can already see some convective initiation because there is a boundary right in through here. There's also a larger warm frontal boundary out ahead of this. So what we're gonna see is tomorrow evening, the models are continuing to develop isolated, possibly kind of single celled thunderstorms initially, okay? Those would be supercells that then potentially line out into a grouping of storms that will move across Kansas, Oklahoma, and Central Texas. So that will happen mostly overnight. So we're gonna have to watch the evolution of the storms very carefully. Meanwhile, more rain spreads into this area. And one of the interesting things about this next wave is that it seems to be this, this very elongated pressure trough. Can you see it there? There's no really well-defined center of circulation through Wednesday afternoon, which means it spreads rain all the way from Louisiana clear up to Minnesota, right here in the midsection of the United States. It won't be until late on Wednesday that we start to see the low really developing here over parts of the Mid-South in Arkansas and, and, and Missouri. And at that point, it's gonna be spreading quite a bit of rainfall into this region, all right? Meanwhile, we do have another front that's going into British Columbia and spreading some precipitation into Oregon uh, and, and Washington as well, including some snow in the mountains here. All right, so that gets us out there through you know Wednesday night. I wanna mention one thing before we look at the other two models. This is gonna be windy. As I play, let's just take this out to, again, um, the Thursday morning. You can see that as that low emerges, it's gonna have some very strong winds around it. Gusts here getting between that 30 to 40, maybe 50 mile an hour range. And don't forget, we're still dealing with very strong winds. There's high wind warnings out for parts of Montana today and into tomorrow where there's strong winds. Now, I haven't yet talked about what's going up the East Coast. I'm sure your eye went there first, but there is a coastal low I'm going to show you in a few moments that as it moves up along the East Coast, it's going to be producing very, very strong winds and very rough seas in this area. So why don't we go look at that by comparing the European model on the right to the GFS on the left, okay? So as we play through, here we go. That's getting out there to Tuesday. There's that coastal low I was mentioning. Some of the bigger shifts we've seen with this coastal low is that it tends to want to stay a little bit farther east than initially kind of uh, forecast. But that's still gonna be bringing some heavy rains into parts of Pennsylvania, New York, I mean the whole of, of New England and through here as we work our way through midday tomorrow on Tuesday. Then we saw the next system we talked about. There it is in both models shown in the midsection of the country. So we're gonna watch for those stronger severe storms on Wednesday to be farther to the south here, but expect those storms possibly getting into the mid-south as well. So that catches us up on all three models. Let's now let the European and the GFS take over. A deeper trough develops over the Tennessee and Ohio valleys right here. And it's gonna sit there and, and, and spin as it gets kind of, um, get some close contours and close that one off. And as it does so, it's gonna take a while to get that soggy weather out from Thursday into Friday. So I'm kind of rocking back over Thursday and Friday. And you can see that both models keep that low in place here. So it's gonna be another kind of cold and soggy end of the week, probably ruin a lot of folks, you know, Halloween weekend plans here. So as we play this forward though, let's get out there to Saturday mid uh, morning, Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening. That moves into the Northeast and kind of clears out parts of the Midwest. 
as we then get into Sunday, of course, Halloween here. I, I have some kids that watch this, so I'm going to talk about it. Uh, this gets us out to Sunday um, um, afternoon and Sunday evening. Now, you look overall at Sunday evening, and I, I think your eyes see in the blues. I'll talk about that in a second. But much of the country is going to have you know, a decent time for trick-or-treating. But this is interesting. Showing up in the European, and it is showing up in the GFS. I'll show you in a second. We're going to have some cold air coming around the back of this. There's high pressure building in too. We're going to kind of squeeze a boundary right in through this area. And you'll see that Sunday night into Monday morning, there's the chance that we're bringing in some snow to Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Kansas. See it right there? Now, one of the things that we're seeing here is that once we get past Monday into Monday evening, the models are doing a little bit, well, they're kind of diverging a bit on where they're going to take this potential snow event in parts of the high plains here. The European model's trying to drag this farther to the south and take the colder air with it. And you're going to see here that the European model, look at this, this is out Tuesday into Wednesday, um, is really getting aggressive. Now, please understand, I'm at the 216-hour forecast from an operational model run. But we're looking at two different models, and we can see that they both bring in higher atmospheric pressure. That's a pretty clear signal. Remember, we talked about why that would be there at the beginning of this video. So I'm going to have to just watch out for this, and I want you to be watching with, uh, for me with it. It's in the ensembles. It's been in three different runs from both models, and therefore I'm just going to keep an eye on it because we could get some high plain snow here getting into New Mexico, maybe even into Texas. Amounts, it's not even worth really looking at the amounts just yet. But we'll do this. Let's go over the next week looking at the European model. There we go. This is the next seven days of total accumulated precipitation from the European. What you can see is the first system still spinning here into the northeast. We have the system along the coast. We then have the system that we're going to watch the severe weather threat here soak parts of the Mid-South, Missouri, into Iowa and Minnesota, and then slowly move east. And what you've got here, this is mostly still coming in the next 36 hours or so. So that's the European, and here's the GFS. Okay, European GFS. Uh, just because I like to show it to you, here's the comparison. Feel free to pause the video and take a closer look at this. Uh, we can see that the European is going to be wetter in the midsection of the country here. All right, We kind of mix it up as we get into the northeast, but when I look at this map, I see a lot more of these colors suggesting that the European's the wetter model at this point than the GFS is, especially in just kind of a, a broad brush stroke there. From here, what I want to now do is I want to show you that snowfall. So this is an operational run, remember that. But what we're watching for, okay, this is snow through the next couple of days here in the mountains. We are expecting that. Here's Friday, getting into Saturday, and we could get some light snow spreading across parts of the Canadian Prairie, very light snow here. But our question is about Monday, right? So here's Sunday night into Monday morning, and the latest European, I'll just take you out here to next Tuesday morning, is spreading snow in this area. Now remember, operational run, the ensembles, they do bring snow into this area as well, but we can't use this to assess an amount just yet. What I'm just trying to make you aware of is that early next week, we need to be on the lookout for possible snow here in parts of the high plains. Because that high pressure system that's coming in here, squeezing that air farther to the south is, is pretty strong. Now, from there, why don't we just look at another map that gives us an idea about where it's going to be wettest. This is the next 10 days looking at precipitation um, probabilities of being more than an inch of rainfall. And so again, that's the area we were discussing, the system going up the coast, and all of this kind of gathering in the northeast is going to produce very wet conditions in through here. And we've been extremely wet in this area as of late anyway. So this is uh, certainly going to be adding kind of insult to injury in that region. Week two, now we get out to what we discussed, but now we're going to look at the European. See how the trough is backed up? And the ridge is now sitting over the west and over the mountains. We have the down, or excuse me, we have the northwest flow, the convergent flow into this area, and then it exits into the northeast. And we have displaced that massive ridge that has been sitting in place right here. So as a consequence, the week two precipitation pattern does favor, you know, near normal to drier than normal conditions across a big area that has been very wet due to that southwest flow in the jet stream. So we're switching that up and bringing it out of the northwest, hence the drier conditions. All right. From here, let's go talk about temperatures. And why don't we just start off first by looking at those max temperatures. So we've already realized these temperatures today. Let's get into tomorrow. There's Thursday's, or excuse me, Tuesday's highs, warm in the southern plains, out ahead of the next system. They're getting into Wednesday. Much of the U.S. is seeing near normal to cooler than normal. Getting into Thursday, we start to see the warm-up happening in the west. 
That's when the ridge builds in. And by Friday and Saturday, that ridge is in place. We do have, I should have just detailed this more for you, but we have a chance of snow on Saturday coming in here first on that high pressure cell, but very cold compared to average in the south and southwest. And there you go, you can see the colder air sliding down with that high pressure center on Sunday. Now this only goes out a week, and I'm recording this on Monday, so I only got through Sunday here. But if we look at those minimum temperatures, we're kind of look for where there's frost. We see there's Tuesday morning's lows, so we're going to keep an eye out on this region for some frost. And then as we go forward into Wednesday, got some cooler extending all the way down here into the, you know, the, the Carolinas in the 40s early in the morning. And then there's Thursday, getting into Friday and Saturday. All right. Sunday morning lows. This is where we're gonna to have to watch out for the cooler air to really come in to be supportive of that snow on Sunday night into Monday and Tuesday. From there, let's just go out there and look at the day five through 10 pattern. Now, something interesting here. We see that colder air coming in, but this little area through here that's much colder than normal, that's because the model's responding to the snow that it's producing. So that's why you see temperatures there that are you know, 15 to 20 degrees cooler than average in Fahrenheit. And then remember that all progresses east, and now we come back to those maps I showed you earlier. There's our cooler bias here, and it's also, whoops, there we go, in the European day 10 through 15, which gets us out to the 9th of November. So the end of October and the beginning of November are gonna be a far cry from what we've seen so far in the month of October. I wanna finish up with one last kind of longer range thing, okay, La Nina. This was last year on the 25th. Now take a look at the differences, are you ready? Lining to developing and moving quick a year ago, this is what it looks like this year. Much different. Look at how much colder it is in the North Pacific this year where those troughs have been hanging out. And I've been thinking about this pattern change, wondering if it's going to give us a stronger signal for the upcoming month because the Southern Oscillation Index is up here, you know, around an 11 or 12. That tells you those trade winds are strong. We're watching for that MJO to move into phase one, two, and three. Could slide over to three and four should the trade winds continue to pick up. We want to ask ourselves what that might mean. So if we come back to where we started, right in through here, the, the Corn Belt, the Midwest, the Great Lakes, been very warm into the Northeast. I went and reconstructed for the month of November and December what our temperatures have looked like since 1970. All right, And I plucked off the coldest years and got them all ranked up and made a composite. What I want you to be watching for all right, is the flip, complete flip over to a trough in this area. That would only happen if we ridge out over Alaska. That tends to be what has to occur. So if we're going to watch for a pattern that takes us over into very cold early winter, it's going to take place with a shift in the jet stream pattern of Alaska and uh, the Green Bay, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Hudson Bay. And why I'm bringing this up is because the correlations with La Nina are not strong yet. They don't really come on until December, January, February. So it's going to be more about that wave train movement. It's going to be hard to do this. This is what I'm pointing at here. It's going to be hard to do this, though, because these ocean temperatures are so cold in this area. So do I call for a brutally cold start to winter? Not with this ocean pattern. And that's where I'm going to wrap this one up. Have a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you again on Thursday. Until then, I uh, hope you keep a close eye on this pattern with me. All right. Thanks.